Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. Today I'm here with a fellow European founder. Uh, his name is Peter Janosik. He is the founder and CEO at Smart Look. Hey Peter. Hi Carlos. Hi everyone. Happy to have you on the show. Uh, I think it's important to highlight also really cool companies that are building stuff for product leaders. And uh, you guys have an incredible run. And uh, you're building a global company. So you, I saw in the news that you recently announced that uh, Cisco is um, announcing their intention to, to acquire your business. So congrats on that. Thank you. And uh, yeah, after taking a look at your website, so that you guys are covering so many different use cases for product managers, from heat maps to back reports to other types of analysis analytics. So, but before all of that, why don't you tell me a little more about kind of that founding story? What was that problem that you were trying to solve back in 2016? Right. So, so I can start. I, if I have to describe that, I need to start a bit sooner. It was uh, roughly 2012 when I was building my my first uh, SaaS product. Uh, it was a smart sub live chat solution uh, for um, e-commerce sites, and uh, in that product we wanted to build a combination of two solutions, like live chat and session recording technology, because uh, it's quite often that when you are solving live chat ticket with uh, with the customer you don't know what happened and the customer is not able to explain what happened before he started or she started to to write you some hmm. some tickets about the problem on on your website so initial idea was let's let's combine these two technologies that someone like the owner of the website or or an agent trying to help you with solve some problem on your website can see actually what was happened a uh, few seconds before uh, they started to write you an, uh, a ticket. So that was the first idea, but it didn't work. As we expected, we made a lot of mistakes from business perspective, but also from product perspective. So we decided in 2016 to spin off session recording technology and launch it as a separate project called SmartLook. And that's, that's how it started. Okay, so session recording was your first feature, or at least the first one that started getting some traction. Yeah, actually, the, the initial idea was just to build super simple scalpel tool. It should not be a solution. It was just a tool for recording customers. Actually, like the idea was super easy. Just everyone who own or who who has Google Analytics on their website should have SmartLook as well because. Smart look can give you an answer why something happened on your website. You know the data on you can get the data from Google Analytics, but you don't know why people are leaving your website, why people are unhappy, and so on. This was the initial idea. Then, of course, we realized that we need to focus on bigger companies. That this like not everyone need or have time to analyze user behavior to improve conversions to to improve digital experience. Only like bigger companies or Companies that have dedicated teams like product managers, UX designers, or marketers, these companies with these teams are ideal customer for SmartLook. So we decided to change initial idea and improve that, adjust that uh, to be able to, to, to keep growth. This is a classic uh, situation that a lot of founders um, find, right? Like you, you build something that's hopefully as a solution to your own problem but there has to be a solution for many other people. Hopefully some of them are willing to pay. So this becomes a business. And I'm just curious to know who were those initial customers for, like in terms of users, was, was this the product manager or the engineer or, or somebody else? Initially, it was focused, or we were focusing on product managers and marketers. These two groups are, were the most important or relevant ones. Uh, but uh, we were targeting small companies and then we realized that we need to go up market and target bigger ones, bigger companies, because these companies has people who had time to, to analyze user behavior and improve digital experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, Peter, where are you based? Czech Republic. So cool. So 
you know, I've, I've hosted so many different um, founders of product companies in the podcast, and most of them are based in the U.S., specifically San Francisco or, or New York. So I'm curious to know, like, from your own perspective, how was it to, to start growing your business and start landing some customers that maybe didn't hear about you or they were, uh, so they, they were more familiar with other competitors that were based in the U.S.? Uh, actually, as I said, Linda, it was not my first SaaS company. Uh, so I had some previous experience from previous uh, SaaS product, and I and, and we did a lot, of, or we made a lot of mistakes, and we want, we didn't want to do the same. We didn't want to do the same mistakes, so we decided, uh, or we basically were focusing on not repeating the same mistakes and it helped us to to grow uh, one of the one of the things we changed was that we were really focusing on product led growth so we were offering smart look product for free for the almost first year and we were just gaining the customers we were not focusing on building payment gateways or we, we didn't focus on on business model and on anything like that we were just focusing on the product and we wanted to be sure that people are using the product and they are interested in the product and they really want to use it. And we didn't want to spend our development time on anything else, only on the product. And that helped us to, to spread the product uh, extremely fast in the beginning. So tell me more about that, because I think that is fascinating that like you were able to focus on the user first, make sure that they had a great experience, even if they weren't willing to pay. I heard you use the word product-led growth. And that's incredible because back in 2016, 17, that wasn't really that mainstream. But obviously, mm -hmm. after a year or so, when you start having true fans, true hardcore users that are not paying, what was that moment for you to test some paid tiers and see if you could turn your product into a business? Uh, when, when it was, or the question is when we decided to, to implement some first uh, paid packages. Actually, it was like roughly a year after we released of our official um, website and started offering a uh, smart look and people can create an account and just use it. So roughly 10 or 12 months after, after that time, because we, we raised money in 2016 and we didn't have enough money to continue and to grow so we had to earn some money somehow so we decided to implement a uh, first paid package but it was super simple something for 20 bucks or so so we said like let's let's launch something just to be able to continue but in that time we already had 100,000 uh, signups and roughly 50% of, of these signups were uh, active so you're saying that just yes, by launching a paid tier, you were able to start monetizing some of your existing users and that was enough to, to get you going? Yes, yes. Uh, and we didn't have to launch anything, any expensive package. It was just because we had, as I said, 100,000 signups. So yeah. we, we were able to somehow communicate with 100,000 uh, users and roughly half of it were actively using the product. And then kind of the moment of truth when you try to go more, as you say, up market, right? To start landing larger accounts. Mm -hmm. Hopefully companies that are going to have many users, many employees using your product. What was that moment like for you? How were you able to structure your product and your company so then you could start actively going to larger companies that maybe didn't have any users using your product yet? So maybe good to mention is that the why we decided to go up market and that was the because of the high churn we we realized that okay so we even if we have fifty thousand active customers and some of them started to pay we saw that after a couple of months they don't have time to use it in long term or they just wanted to try it and because they don't have anyone in the team who can do that in long term uh so we decided that okay so we need to focus on someone who really understand digital experience who really know why it's important and that, that was all before covid so now it's much easier <laughs> that everyone understand like how digital experience uh, is is important but in 2017 
no one was focusing on that uh, so much as today. So, the, but there were companies with professionals or professional teams full of product managers or, or UX designers who understand that that's something pretty important for them. So uh, we realized, okay, we need to focus on these companies and now uh, how to change that. So basically whole communication, we had to change the logo. Uh, it was 2018, so GDPR like, was like the big thing. So we needed to be uh, like trustworthy, like people were sending the data to, to our platform. So every, we had to change everything like communication, style of uh, like how it looks, how, how logo looks, uh, marketing channels, we had to change that as well. So basically all what we uh, yeah. did. Uh, and, was, and where, are you, where are you today as a company? How, how big is it? 90 people, 3,000 paying customers, something like that. I uh, hope that's enough to, to, to understand like how big we are. It's, it's really incredible. I mean, I love how chill you are about it, but it's like a, a lot of work that went behind the scenes in a relatively short period of time. Because if, if you started in 2016, now we're in 2023, it's an incredible journey. And now to hopefully uh, be in, in, in conversations with, with Cisco about the opportunity of joining forces, it's, it's just another big, big step. Um, I was looking at your product and I saw also the evolution from being a session recording feature into mm -hmm. a digital experience platform that includes heat maps, crash reports, uh, analytics, and other features. Um, so I want to learn more about that because I can't Im I've seen a lot of companies that target product managers kind of fall in this trap. Like they usually start being very successful with one feature. They start talking to larger companies, get excited and say, okay, well, in order to land this big account, we need to offer more than just a feature. We need to be a painkiller instead of a vitamin, right? We're going to be the platform for everything. Yeah. Um, but it's hard, right? It's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And I just want, and a lot of them, unfortunately, are not successful. Like a lot of companies that were successful with one feature couldn't make the transition to be a multi-feature or multi-product company. So in your case, what was that evolution like? Mm -hmm. I think it was all connected with, with the churn and trying to find like how to minimize churn, what to bring to customers that they really see the value in the long term. And one of the things we heard quite often was that we don't have time to analyze all the sessions. We have millions of sessions every month and we don't have time to analyze that. So we had to think like how to help them, how to help product managers or UX designers to find the right moment they are looking for or to find some bad user experience their customers had. Uh, so that's why we decided to combine session recording technology with product analytics, which is basically event-based analytics. When you track all the act actions, we call it events, what customers are doing, and then you can just connect that actions with the sessions or replays, session replays, and you can find immediately if something bad happened uh, or if you need to find just specific segment of the customer and we can show you exact moment when customers did that, that moment. So you don't need to watch the whole session. So initially it was just about like watching 30 minute sessions. No one had time on that. So that generated a quite a lot of churn. Like people didn't have time on that. Yeah. And once you connect that with events and like try to build as much as possible, some actionable automatic insights. Uh, for example, like if someone had some JavaScript error or if someone had some rage clicks or some other post similar situation. So you can filter it by many possible, like with many different filters. And from 1 million sessions, you were able to go and to have like 30 sessions and we can show, show you only 30 customers who really had bad experience and it was bad experience in some very critical channel uh, critical funnel which is pretty important for you so you can just lost a lot of money uh, there and you can improve it quite uh, that, that's a trend we've seen we've noticed in very successful product companies like yours that are able to not just show data to the customer but also insights as you meant, as I heard you use the word insights multiple times, like how to capture 
literally what's happening, how to summarize what's happening across millions of sessions or users and be able to you know, summarize it in a way that a product manager in this case can drive action. So just curious to know, how are you guys making that happen? I know there's a lot of buzz now around artificial intelligence, but like w what type of technology or other process you are using to make sure that when you are presenting a insights or a summary of a lot of sessions to a decision maker, you are providing the right information. Yeah, because we we have a lot of data about the customer. So we know like from which browser they came to our website or to product. We know like uh, what device they use, uh, how often they came to the website or product or mobile app. And you can combine all this information and to see, to basically just find the, the segments which are not behaving as other or as you expect that they should behave. And based on that, you can build these insights because you can tell them like, all right, so you have um, 1 million sessions, but only customers from Spain with this browser, they have issue in this form because there is some new update and you know that this update caused this issue. Uh, so you can just show this specific customers to your product manager and they can immediately see that it happens or it is happening only for this specific group of customers. And how are you thinking about uh, in, in AI to help you get mm -hmm. those insights faster? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's extremely hard in our case uh, because there is billions of events on each websites or mobile app and every website and app is a bit different so it's it's hard to use ai in this situation but of course it's something we we can use in the future or just use it for a specific part of your website but not like to to, to keep it and uh, that and to say that all right let's learn based on this data it's not as simple as as it looks and we tried a couple of tests but it's not possible to just uh do it automatically these days mm -hmm. but something which we definitely want to uh improve in the future or use more another thing that i've seen um happen across the board in the in the product stack is the ability for these tools to integrate with each other uh, even for the companies that are trying to play more of a platform game and cover multiple use cases, it's impossible to cover all of the use cases that a product team needs. So I saw on your website integrations with tools such as Slack, with CRMs, with analytics companies. So can you tell me a bit more about how you're thinking about integration so the data that either you or other platform captures can flow seamless, seamlessly? Yeah, integrations are pretty important because then you can have more use cases how to use smart look. Uh, so it's then it's not connected with product managers only, but you can have data in your CRM. And you can see as a salesperson or account manager or customer success manager what what customer was doing on your product or in your product before you uh, contact before you have some session with them or call with him. So uh, you can use the data in other tools. So that's, that's pretty important. Or you can have Slack notifications. So you can get these insights much faster than just uh, ch checking your email or uh, logging into, into a smart look product and see there. So if something happened, if there is some anomaly, uh, let's say like you, you measure something and there are some anomalies so you can get this notification immediately you know, just like and react much uh, and then you can react faster and uh, Peter I'm just curious to know about your current team you mentioned it's around uh, 90 to 100 people 90, 90 people yeah 90 people how are you guys uh, look structured geographically most of our team is in uh, Czech Republic uh, because uh, we have great engineering here or great engineers great product people so and that's 60 percent of our company and uh, we have one uh, person in the uk and that's it i think a few people in slovakia uh, but czech republic is the majority of our team of course not 
everyone is a uh, native Czech person. Uh, we have people coming to Czech Republic from different countries. Uh, so, so, yeah, but the important for us is to, to keep the team in the Czech Republic and to, to, to meet each other quite often. No, I agree. There is tremendous talent, technical and, and business talent in, in Europe. I'm originally from Spain. I moved to Silicon Valley many years ago and uh, I'm always intrigued about from other founders who didn't make that move. Uh, obviously, you, you are a living proof that you can build a very successful company. You can raise capital. You can even uh, potentially get acquired. Um, you can land customers in the U.S. without being here. So, Curious to know if uh, this is something that ever crossed your mind or what was your decision behind building, staying in, in, in Europe and, and keeping most of your team there. It, it was my, uh, one of my goals that I wanted to prove that it's possible to build from Czech Republic global SaaS successful company with a majority of customers from US because 30 or maybe 40% of our revenue is coming from the US. Uh, so that's something what I wanted to prove, and it's possible. Of course, uh, it's. Uh, I think it, it it was possible thanks to our our approach, like product-led growth approach, that we were able to to get customers or get gain new customers uh, through marketing channels and through product-led growth activities. So kind of the, the recipe that I'm trying to, to extract, although there is no recipe, there is no silver bullet, but, but kind of the, the journey is you focus on the product at the very beginning uh, for even more than a year. You created that community of loyal users that really wanted to use your product, even if that product was, was free. And then from there, you started testing monetization with those, with those customers. And then from there, you started branching out into probably larger larger companies, more features, but like there is no replacement for those few years of like building the right product, making sure that you have a small group of people that actually love what you, what you have. Yes, but basically you summarize it quite well, but also listening to customers. Initially, my role was more as a product manager than, than a CEO. So I was really just working on, on the product, uh, building the product with engineering team, Listening the customers, trying to help them on, on uh, with their issues, uh, and yeah, more like product manager than, than CEO, I would say. Yeah, well, let's talk about the transition because that's something also that kind of happens, right? There is no school where they teach you how to become a a, a CEO, and so curious to know when how do you how do you evolve from like being a web developer, a product manager into like, oh my God, now there's more people here. How do you handle now a company of almost a hundred people as, as the CEO? I think it's because you are growing organically. Uh, we were fundraising. We, we did two fundraising rounds. So roughly it was two, 3.5 million in total. Uh, so it was not uh, so much money uh, comparing uh, US-based uh, SaaS companies. So we were growing organically and we bootstrapped uh, many years as well. So that uh, helped me to gain these skills, I would say, if I can call it like that. So because we didn't grow in number of people so fast as other companies or other, let's say our competitors, uh, it helps us to to learn from our mistakes and um, still like continue uh, with solid growth. Yeah, but but still, you know, it's a pretty big transition when you start you code less and focus more on other type of situations that you haven't faced before. Do you have any formal training, any mentors, anyone around you that was? Uh, helping you navigate certain situations? Um, I don't think so. Any, any, no. <laughs> Actually, I, I decided to have a first mentor just six or seven months ago because I realized that, like, all right, now, when you have almost 100 people, it's not, it's not just about common sense. You, you, really need to, uh, you really need to be a good manager and you need to study it a bit. But I think that... Like, Till 100 people in the team, it's still like common sense and just be transparent and 
threatening people, try to help them, and that's it. Uh, now, when you have 100 plus people in the team, it started to be more complicated. You need to build managers or other and other manager layers, and it's something you should probably learn somewhere. And what's your relationship with the product team specifically? I'm, I'm asking because I, I can imagine for a product CEO, it's it's hard to let go certain certain things that you are great at to create a space for other leaders to shape your vision. Uh, I found great uh, co-founder and CTO. So I kind of move, move this uh, like CPO role a bit to him. A couple of years ago, so it, it's thanks to that I was able to uh, stop focusing on product as I was focusing in the beginning, and I was focusing more on on marketing, sales, and customer success. Uh, but now I see that it's something I would change. I would rather I, I would stay uh, on, connected with product team on a regular basis. All the time. So now I'm go coming back to the product team and trying to be connected uh, on a regular uh, basis uh, with product uh, and engineering people again, because it's uh, it's pretty important to to be uh, connected with the product team uh, whole time. Uh, my last question for you is: What's next for SmartLook? Uh, that's. I think that's. <laughs> It's it's connected with the Cisco announcement or Cisco acquisition. Uh, so I think that we finally, or not finally, but we can play in the first league with them, like or our technology can play in the first league uh, with them. I see that market is kind of converging, or that on the market there are like a couple of segments. One of them I already mentioned. The digital experience analytics, it's typical for smart look. There are product analytics. Uh, we also cover part of the product analytics segment as well, but there are other segments like digital uh, experience monitoring, digital adoption, and so on. And the, all these segments are kind of converging and collide, colliding uh, with each other. And there is a lot of acquisition happening on the market. So I believe that in the future, and it's quite soon, it can be like three, four years, from now, that there will be some, I call it like super solution for digital experience, like in general. So you can monitor like from uh, like releasing new features or monitoring the backends, uh, backend activities or server activities, uh, the product uh, activ uh, production activities, to monitor like JavaScript errors and everything. Like, like basically, uh, you can see the whole picture not only in, uh, as it is in our case now in uh, what is happening in uh, after releasing something, but you can monitor that uh, before you release that and so on. So I s think that there will be some super solution and I want to be part of it. And thanks to this possible cooperation with uh, Cisco, uh, I believe that we can deliver that to on the market. Uh, it's been great to have you on the show, Peter. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me.